And I do want to bring Wayne back on. I told him I was going to bring him back on for a pop quiz at the end. So, uh, Wayne, come on back. And, you know, it feels like this uh, this whole uh, webinar has been a bit of a race against the clock, but it also in some ways feels like soil health is a bit of a race against the clock in that, you know, we want to make sure that we can implement the practices that we need to implement before we lose land uh, from, from production or from, you know, in its uh, use in, in the environment or whatever the case may be. But uh, I guess one of the questions that I have, and this actually comes from the audience, so I can't claim it, is uh, do you think the rate of adoption of these practices is happening fast enough to keep land from being retired out of production? Uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid the, uh, the answer is no. Uh, it's not happening fast enough. I, I know that there are some people that refer to subdivisions as the uh, final crop rotation. And, and I'm afraid that uh, that's the truth that we see. And any time any of us get on an airplane, all we have to do is look out the window and we'll see it. Um, I'm, I'm, I recall the day I thought I was out in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming, uh, looking at rangeland and, and digging holes. And I walked to the top of the hill and there it was, another subdivision. That's the last place I thought that I would ever find it. And so, unfortunately, when you look at the Census of Agriculture uh, data, it shows uh, we um, are only have uh, no tillage on about uh, some 37% of our cropland and about uh, and cover crops only about five or 6% of our cropland. Uh, and so we have a long ways to go, but we are losing land at a very alarming rate. And so, no, I'm afraid we're not keeping up. Um, what that just means uh, that we, have to significantly improve the health of the soils on the land that we do have, uh, and that we have to continue uh, to uh, communicate the value of that to our environment, to our ecosystems, to uh, fighting climate change, for providing wildlife, pollinator habitat, uh, and that we really, I feel like we need to really uh, engage uh, the consumers uh, in doing our, our marketing to them out of those benefits that improved soil health brings to the environment. Uh, and therefore to society and the greater public. And so, um, unfortunately, I feel like we are um, way behind, uh, but uh, it is nice to see so much interest in soils and soil health. Uh, and so I think we, uh, we got a fighting chance, uh, but we don't have time to tarry. So Wayne, with, with making this idea of adopting these practices a little less daunting, are there, are there local soil health targets that you have or your organization has, or where do we go from here? How can we start this process of, of bringing soil health back? Yeah, you know, um, uh, some of the discussion today has been about what are the most effective measurements, right? And, and uh, it, it's interesting, like we started off on a project evaluating what are the most effective measurements. And and we now feel like uh, we've identified uh, several that can be universally applied, but still the conversation today uh, also shows that it depends on some of the local conditions. Um, like uh, one, one of our, our panelists uh, talked about having, you know, a clay pan in their soil. And so they think the penetrometer, you know, looking at a penetration resistance is, is really important for them. Uh, and others have uh, other conditions that, that may think that one other measurement over another is very good. So while we have these uh, effective measurements identified, uh, we also still realize that those local conditions uh, will also um, identify what should be complemented, what types of additional measurements are needed, you know, for assessing of those challenges that, again, describe how well that soil is functioning in that place. Uh, we've heard a lot about kind of place-based uh, uh, issues, measurements, looking at systems focuses, systems focus today, uh, all those things uh, intertwine. Uh, for us, uh, we feel like that now that we are getting those uh, more universally applicable uh, soil health measurements identified, uh, then it becomes the next challenge is uh, how do you interpret those measurements? Just how healthy can your soil get? Uh, different soils have different capacities. Uh, it's pretty easy for most of us to see that different soils have different carbon storage capacities. Uh, well, the same is true uh, for some of the other parameters for measure for soil health. And so we are uh, using uh, the approach uh, that Tim Cruz uh, actually was talking about uh, an hour or so ago, uh, where we are looking at some reference sites uh, that uh, basically do mimic kind of those, um, those um, optimal conditions for improving soil health. And we are going to some of those sites. We've done this in three major land resource areas and we're uh, expanding it to four different states uh, this summer. 
uh, where we can uh, look at these different uh, uh, measurements uh, on those uh, reference sites, those that, are, that have been optimally managed for soil health, to see just how healthy that soil can get. So that can give us, you know, kind of a, um, a goal, a goal post. That does not mean that we would make that goal in something like a corn soybean rotation. So we then we feel like it's important at that point that we say, okay, this soil can get this healthy. It can have this level of aggregate stability. It can store this much carbon um, and those types of parameters. Uh, but then we need to go to sites like a corn soybean rotation, for example, and that have been optimally managed, let's say for 20 years for, you know, something like that, like, like they're no-tilling it, like they're using cover crops, they're, they're doing all the right things. And they may be able to get 80% of the way there to where that soil uh, can get in terms of its capacity for health. And so at that point, we would be in a really good position uh, to um, stay well. And, you know, this is how healthy we know these particular soils can get. Uh, we know in a corn soybean rotation, using the same example, it can get some 80% of the way there. And now we have a, a useful measure of how we can interpret uh, anyone's uh, soil health test. And we have, uh, we have some uh, ideas and some plans in place uh, for uh, basically allowing people to go online and, and define their soil, see on how healthy it can get, and, uh, and then to you know, kind of measure how well they're doing. So we think that this can be really kind of that next um, that next frontier essentially for soil health so we can provide um, that uh, that benchmark uh, and uh, so that's what we're working towards now and, and wayne to learn more about that or you know if, if anybody was going to go find more resources after today's uh, session just go to the soil health institute website is that the best place yeah that'd be a great place uh, there actually is a, a blog that's written on this particular topic that i just introduced here at the end but uh yeah, they would go there. If, if you don't mind, I just, I would love to take just a couple more minutes. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I, I just felt like that there were so many common themes here. I just kind of wanted to highlight them uh, really quickly. And, and, and one of them is, of course, uh, economics. Uh, that would just kind of kept coming out, whether it's uh, looking at uh, reducing costs, uh, but also looking at, you know, your your, your changes in nutrient management for mounting compost and those types of things. Um, and another common thing was remembering the land managers, uh, you know, the, the, whether it's the farmers or the gardeners, that was just a, a common theme that came out in so many different ways. Another was the system focus, um, uh, whether it's, uh, I love what Lydia was talking about, kind of looking at um, not just the kind of the soil plant relationships, that type of system like that Sarah elucidated, but Lydia also mentioned this other system from the, the farmer to the certified crop advisor to the lender, the insurance agent, you know, that, that type of, uh, kind of kind of structure around the system. Um, another was kind of that, um, that uh, these, these types of measurements that, that can be widely applied, that they're really still a kind of place-based uh, also. So I hope you don't mind me just kind of throwing those points in. I was trying to kind of take notes on some of these common threads and they just kept coming at me. So I just, I wanted to share those because I have to figure that if they were repeated so many times uh, that it's worth mentioning at the end that, uh, that there are these commonalities that all of us working in this area are identifying and which I think is very encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I'm glad it's a, it, that actually serves as a perfect wrap up. So thank you, Wayne. You, you passed your, your pop quiz there. And uh, just want to thank you and, and all the panelists really that we had today. Uh, I'm hearing that the chat was very engaged as well. So thank you for those of you who contributed and thank you for those of you who attended. I think it's really been a tremendous event and kudos to Dr. Abby Wick and everyone who helped uh, make this possible because I think it turned out wonderfully.